We're going to talk a little bit about teaching styles today. And I was sniffing around on some of this today, and I came across the humor of Stephen Wright. And he has this kind of deadpan, low-energy approach. I, I, how somebody can do that and be funny. You've, you've seen those guys that can do that, though. And uh, some of his classic lines, for instance, he says, hard work pays off in the future, laziness pays off now. So you can see he's, a, he's quite an intelligent individual. Uh, he said, he's the guy that said, eagles may soar, but weasels don't get sucked into jet engines. <laughs> so... A couple more here. Uh, he said, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. Uh, and I like that. And uh, for all you people who drive a Ford, uh, he said, my mechanic told me I couldn't repair your brakes, so I made your horn louder. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I throw that at you this morning because I, I just kind of want you to consider the different things that, that people who have to speak or teach or talk uh, they all have kind of their own style of doing that, their own way of communicating. Um, you know, some people are into kind of experiential learning and they bring the, they bring the audience into the process. Uh, we've all had way, way, way too much in whatever time you spent in school of lecture, kind of somebody up there talking. And I know you get a lot of that in church. Uh, there's, there's kind of discussion and feedback. Well, that's, one of the, that's one of the things that makes Alpha so dynamic is you, you listen to the video uh, so the teaching comes at you through video, but then everybody has had supper together at their tables, and then you get a chance to, you know, kind of talk about what they heard and ask questions and share together. So that's an important way, um, kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction. It's it's important, but we're looking today at a at a at a strategy that Jesus used when he taught, and uh, it's called par parable. And a parable is 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 a short story, it's usually fictitious, and it's told to teach a spiritual truth or to illustrate a moral or religious principle. And you're familiar with this, I know you are. I mean, some of Jesus' most familiar parables, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son. A at face value, parables are simple. They're almost too simple. You know, they're unnerving because they're too simple. And they, they usually deal with material from everyday life. At least it was every... when Jesus', Jesus parables were about everyday life for the people at, at, at that time. Uh, some of them, you know, we're not that connected to. But it's stuff that the people who were listening to him in the context of it were very connected to. They were very familiar things. People could relate to those parables instantly because they, they knew it. And Jesus used this kind of teaching to great advantage. About a third of his teaching was parable. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you, they, they record a lot of parables. Uh, John doesn't include any, I don't think. But th here's the thing about when Jesus talked in parables or taught, taught in parables. It seems like he was doing two things at the same time. He was both clarifying truth on the one hand, but he was muddying the water on the other. And that's weird. He seemed to be trying to, to enlighten some people, and he seemed to be uh, attempting to kind of confuse others. It, it was a strange, really a strange way for him to choose to teach. Uh, check out this. This is in Matthew 13, verse 10, and it's just some of his explanation of why he taught in parables. And he said this, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he, Jesus, replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. That's a, that's a strange sentence. It's hard to understand, but when you think about it in the, in the context of him teaching in an intentional way that some people get it and others don't get it. And he says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand or hear. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And here's some of the explanation for it. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. 
They have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you truly, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear. And of course, he's speaking about the fact that after 400 years of silence, the New Testament declares that Jesus showed up in our world, as the, as, the, as the Bible terms it, at the opportune moment, at just the right time, in the fullness of time. He came and he started teaching, but here's the deal. Not everyone was listening. And Jesus was teaching this style of teaching, and so he incorporated this parable thing, and a parable was kind of like a push, It was kind of like a nudge. It could push a person towards the truth or it could push a person away from the truth. It all depended on the person. The message takes that, the same passage we just read where Jesus explains why parables. Here's how the message version puts this. And it really, it speaks. Look at this. It says, Uh, Jesus said, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. This is the same passage now, just in a different version. You've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there's no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. That's why I tell stories or parables. To create readiness, to nudge the people toward a welcome awakening. In their present state, I love this, in their present state, they can stare till doomsday and not see it. Listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. So, you got to be pretty careful in your life when you are contemplating receiving truth and listening to what God says. You've got to think seriously about that. It's a big deal. I mean, even if you're in the habit of listening, trying to listen to the Lord, you've got to be very careful in those moments when you sense that He's speaking. And when I say He's speaking, He's speaking to you or to me. Like when there's a, when there's a personal edge to it. I suppose every time you read the Bible, there is a personal edge to it. But there's those moments when it just feels like, man, that, that's jumping out at me. I mean, you've, you've walked out of service sometime, and you said, man, it just felt like Pastor Brent was just, that was, that was for me. Well, that was, the, that was the Holy Spirit applying that to you, and he can do that with something someone says or with a passage of Scripture. And you've got to be very, very, very careful not to push truth away or resist when you feel that the Lord is trying to push truth on you. You've got to be receptive. Because it's obvious that while the Word of God, especially the Word of God to you, can, can enlighten and inspire and lift up someone who's hungry and listening, it can confuse and even repel the heart of someone who is disinclined to hear. Now, I'm not talking about asking honest questions or doubts. Like, you know, you can't follow the teaching of Jesus and not think he's open to questions. You see that in the scripture, but you, anybody, anybody that you've tried that, that here that's tried to walk with God in their life, you know that it seems like he's okay with you pushing back and you asking questions and you having doubts. I mean, how many times have you said after something happened or after you read something or you're in the midst of something and you, you say to God, you know, God, like, God, what's up with that? Like, why? What, what's going on here? And there seems to be, the Holy Spirit seems to be able to have that interaction where, thankfully, you know, there's plenty of room for the doubter. There's plenty of room for someone to explore and to ask questions. That's one of the amazing things about Alpha. And I'm not talking about that kind of back and forth that a person has with God as they try to find truth. But I'm talking about a person who, is, who, who, who may have an inclination away from the Word of God versus an inclination towards God or towards the Word. An attitude of heart that like wants to receive and wants to obey versus an attitude of heart that's resistant and disinclined to, to listen. And I, hey, I just have to tell you, 
I have been both of those people. And I've been both of those people in my very recent past. Like that's a part of who, that is a part of who I have been and who I am. There are times when I just feel like, I just feel like, God, I'm ready. Like speak. And there are times when I feel, feel him working and, and speaking that, that song, a holy God or whatever that last, is that a new song? It seemed, it seemed new to me. It just, uh, you know, there are times when you feel like, wow, and you, you, you're, you feel receptive. There are other times when you frankly feel ambivalent and somewhat disinterested, you know. And what I'm trying to say to you is that seems to be a big thing when, when God is speaking. Be very careful when you choose to ignore or resist a word that's coming your way, especially from the Lord. Because you have to be ready to receive truth. You know that, eh? Like you, you, you're here and you may hear what, what I'm saying or what God's saying or whatever, but that's only part of the, the deal. If you're not in, an inner, in the inner part of you, if you're not ready to receive and inclined to receive and bent with your ear, the, the ears of your heart, as the Bible says, if they aren't kind of inclined towards God and ready, uh, you're not in the right posture. How many understand that not everybody's ready to hear the truth? They aren't listening. They have no intention of listening. Just because you go to a counselor for your marriage and they give you advice doesn't mean they can help you. If you're not, if you're not listening and you're not there to receive and you're not there to learn, you can pay big bucks to a marriage counselor and have no intention of doing what the counselor says. Just because the doctor says, hey, buddy, you better stop doing that or you better start doing that means nothing unless you're willing to pay attention. Why? Because there are people among us that think they're smarter than the counselor. You know, we think we're smarter than the doctor. We know more. We wouldn't know good advice if we fell over it kind of thing. There are people that don't even recognize it when the people who love them the most are pleading with them to hear what they're saying. What's that? Remember that show that was on? Uh, they would stage these, like, interventions or something and they'd have somebody in their family that was like climbing fool's hill and just really messing up their life and their family's life and the fa the, you know the people who loved them and knew them would kind of get together and they'd walk in and didn't know that everybody was you know it was a meeting uh you know th those kind of people and it's not just people with like those kind of problems there's a lot of there's a lot of husbands that won't listen to their spouse there's a lot of wives that aren't they're not listening to their to their to their family to their spouse they they're they're resistant they aren't listening to the psychologist they're not they're not they're 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 not, they're not listening to the doctor they don't listen to their pastor they, they they don't listen to their mother they don't listen to their spouse their friends and they're sure as you know it they're not listening to Jesus they don't have any intention that's why in John 16, 8, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. And the word convict there kind of means convince, persuade. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will persuade men of their sin. That's, the, that's, 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 what, that's what he does. But you've got to be ready to listen. Did you ever have your mother or father say to you, you know, like, dig the wax out of your ears because you're not listening to me, right? And we don't. Jesus knew who was listening. John 2.25 says that Jesus didn't need anybody's testimony about man. Here's the phrase. For he knew what was in a man. And so I'm saying all that to give you a little backdrop to this whole parable thing. That Jesus was laying this stuff out but it wasn't like in a vacuum, as they say. He understood who was listening. He knew what was going on in their lives. He was strategically laying out truth for the people inclined to hear and the people disinclined to miss it. And we're looking today at the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And we've been systematically working through Matthew's gospel. The way the teaching kind of works here is is we will have times in the year when there's a special, you know, maybe it's Christmas or maybe coming up in June, we're going to be focused on drawing near to God. And we'll have, we'll have a period of three, four weeks where we'll zero in on a particular issue 
and uh, we'll leave Matthew's gospel behind. But then when that emphasis is over, we're back in whatever book we're journeying through, and Matthew is, is, uh, is this one. And last Sunday, Pastor Brent was supposed to speak from the first part of Matthew 13, which is the parable of the sower and the seed. And we had so many baptisms that he basically got kicked off the stage, sort of. So he kind of, you know, he kind of set up the baptism and talked about baptism. But uh, he's coming back next, so he'll be here next Sunday. And the plan is, as far as I know, I'm doing the end of Matthew 13 this morning, and he's doing the, the beginning of Matthew 13 next week. So we're a little out of sync here, but I think it works because uh, the, the, two, the two parables are different, but they relate. Spoiler alert, though, the parable of the sower and the seed says that God is planting seed, and the seed that he's planting is the word of God in people's lives, but not everybody's listening. Not everybody's receiving. You could, you, could read the, you could read the parable of the sower and think, okay, uh, you know, God's batting about 30% on the seed taking root and germinating in, a, in, in someone's life. He's talking, but not everybody's listening. It was true in the time of Noah. It was true in the days of the prophets. It was true in the early church. It was true in the times of the reformers. It's, it's true in the times of great awakening. It's going to be true when Jesus returns. The church and people of the people of God, people who are listening to God, are a minority voice. And that's true in our society, right? The people that are tuning in and trying to do what God wants to do. We're in a minority. A minority voice is pretty important. Like you may think... Man, I, I think I'm the only Christian in my class or something at school. You ever remember feeling that way? Well, don't just, you know, that may be true. You might feel that way. You might think, you know, I'm the only person in my entire family that goes to church. I'm the only believer. You might be in that kind of a situation, but I want to tell you, a minority voice for the Lord always has been a very critical, important thing. And, and that's kind of what this whole chapter 13 zeroes in on, but Brent's going to download that next week. It's going to be awesome. And uh, we're going to look at Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30, the parable of the weed and the tares, or the weed and the weeds. And it's not complicated. It's very plain. It lays it right out there, but it's pretty disturbing. And I want to say a few things about parables, a couple more things here before we get to it. I'm going to get to it. About where a person who's confronting the teaching of Jesus is. Like if you're here and you are listening to the preaching and the teaching and you're thinking about the Lord and you're kind of considering all this, I want to tell you what you got. And what you've got, if you were here Easter Sunday morning, you heard Pastor Brent preach an amazing word on, on the historical veracity of the gospel and the existence of Jesus and all the all the facts that we stand upon as far as history and geography, that Jesus actually, there was a, 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 a man named Jesus who actually did live and, and claimed to be the Son of God and was crucified. And there actually were hundreds of people who, who claimed to have seen him in his resurrected state. Like, there's a whole lot of history stuff that we stand upon. If you're thinking about Jesus or considering this whole deal, what you got is you've got at least some pretty good stuff to stand in stability on. You, there's some stuff you can know, but there's a heck of a lot of stuff you don't know. There's going to be, there's going to be parts of this that as much as you try, it's, it's going to still boil down to the fact that with all the evidence you get, and, 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 and that's not the only thing that goes into a person deciding to choose Jesus. Like, you know, you've got... You've got who he was, and you've got all this historical issue, and you've got uh, his words, and you've got his work in your life, what you feel that, he, that he's doing in you. You've got your, his voice in your heart. You've got the testimony and the prayers of other people. Like, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a person finally saying, I need you, God. Like, you don't just get there, right? It takes, there's a process, you, and, and you've got a lot of that stuff. You may be the recipient of, some, of somebody's prayers for years. Somebody might have witnessed to you or talked to you. You might have, 
you know, in, in kind of a mystical way, come across a book. Do you know how many people have actually come to Christ because they've been in a hotel room and opened a Gideon Bible? I mean, it's, it's wild. And that's, that's the work of God working in you to draw you. You've got all those things, but I'll tell you what you don't have. You don't have proof. You're never going to get to the point where it's like a watertight case and you just say, well, you know, there's no choice here. I just got to step into this. No, you're not going to get there. Why? Because, because it's, going to require, it's going to require faith. It's going to require saving faith. Faith is what pleases God and brings you into fellowship with him. You might be very, very convinced to believe, but you will never be at the point where you will not need faith. And so what are we left with? We're left with these glimpses of what he can do. We're left with plenty of room to disbelieve. Like there's lots of reasons to, to say no. I mean, you think about, what about answered prayer? Uh, it, yeah, it's the kick around that phrase, uh, wow, prayer works. I've never liked that phrase. It's like prayer works. It's like it's some kind of a strategy, some kind of a pill or something, right? Prayer works. But here's the deal. You have situations where you pray and God like miraculously, stupendously steps in and answers prayer. And you go, like it blows you away, right? Those are, those are one, that, that may be part of what God does to draw you to himself. But on the other hand, there's times when you ask and you plead and you beg and he doesn't. That's the problem with it. The same with miracles and healings. It seems like sometimes he does. But then more often, it seems some, that he doesn't. If I was the chairman of the board in heaven, you know, I would, I would say, Lord, you could clear up this problem quite easily. You know, all you've, got, all you've got to do is just present a more watertight case. Like, just be more consistent. Just prove to people that this is the way it is. But he doesn't do that. Why? Because you're left having to believe. So you say, why, why does he make it so difficult? Well, he's sifting. And he's sorting. He knows that everybody who's listening is not listening in the same way. He's trying to set a line between those who are inclined to believe or disinclined to believe. Because seeking God requires belief. One of my favorite verses is 1 Peter 1.8. And it says, it uses this phrase, Whom having not seen, we love. Whom having not seen, we love. Like that's, that's part of the deal, Right? We, we've got this love relationship with him, and we've never seen him. All right, long intro, quick message. All right, long, long intro. But very, this passage just, it says it, and I'm going to lay it out for you here. We're in Matthew 13, parable of the wheat and the weeds. Here we go. Here's another story or parable Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field, but that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted wheat among the weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went into him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? No, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. So that's the story. Then a couple verses later, Jesus explains clearly the meaning of the parable of the story. Verse 36. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house, and his disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. <clears throat> Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer. He just lays it out. The Son of Man is the farmer who planted the good seed. The field is the word, the world, sorry. The field is the world. And the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the harvesters are the angels. So there it is. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom, 
Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Thank you for coming today. <laughs> That's it. And I want to unpack it with a little, little simple outline that will just kind of help you remember it, I hope. First, I want you to see a fourfold set of pairs. There's all these pairs in this story. There's two seeds, for example. There's the good seed and the bad seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night as the workers slept, the enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat. Two seeds. What does the good seed represent? It represents the people of the kingdom, the children of God. The bad seed represents... The children of the evil one, or as Jesus more specifically called him, the devil. In the parable of the sower next week, the seed is the word of God planted in the field of our hearts. But in this parable, the seed represents God's people planted in the world and the devil's people planted in the world. Stop and think about that. I mean, right there. That, 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 is, that, that is what is true. God has his people, and the devil has his people, and both are planted in the world. The field is the world. It's, it's not the church. There are some people that kind of teach this as though, you know, the, it, it, they're plant, the, the good people and the bad people are both planted in the church. And while that is true, probably, it's not what this is about. This is about the world. Fourfold set of pairs, two seeds, good seed and bad seed, two sowers, Jesus and the devil, and they're both... They're both planted. The good seed, it says, it's planted by the Son of Man. And so we see two sowers. We see Jesus sowing and the devil sowing. You say, now, Don, you don't really believe there's a devil. Like, come on. The devil, right? And the problem is, I know it's weird, but Jesus believed in the devil, a devil, the devil. I don't know how you can look at the world today and see good and not see evil. I mean, that's another whole big discussion. But Jesus believed this. Two seeds, two sowers, and two children. There's the children of God and the children of the evil one. Now, it's probably a good place just to remind everybody that there's nowhere in Scripture that the universal fatherhood of God is taught. What is that? Well, it's, it's like, well, God is our Father. I mean, I've gone to hundreds and hundreds of funerals in my, in my ministry. And I've gone to some funerals where, like, you, you, you listen to the, 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 the rector or the pastor or whoever teaches or preaches at the deal, and you'd think, we're all God's children. God loves us all. And our brother now be, has gone, and he's now the departed, and he's been taken by Father God. And he's now in heaven. It's kind of this picture that if you're alive, you're here. And if you're dead, you're in heaven. The universal fatherhood of God. Because he's creator and he's God. I mean, I, part of me thinks that would be awesome. That would be awesome if that was true. But it sure doesn't seem true if you take the words of Scripture. The words of Scripture present a different feeling that we're not all God's children by default. On the contrary, we're all the devil's children by default. Like it gets worse, right? Because of Adam and Eve and because of original sin. The Bible says we were, we were conceived in sin. We are born spiritually dead. We aren't good people who learn how to be bad. We are bad people who need to, who need to become good. Anybody raise kids, they got that one figured out, right? And that's, that's really what the Bible said. It says there are two families in the world. There's the family of God, the children of the king, the redeemed of the Lord. There's that family, and there are, are the children of the devil. And, and there's all these word pictures that speak about how Jesus wants to move you from one family to the other. You, you, you know, he translates us. He restores us. He adopts us. He transforms us. We're, there's a rebirth we're, we're brought into this new relationship with God and we're moved from death unto life, from the family of the enemy, the devil, to the family of God. It's an amazing, amazing thing. There are two seeds, there are two sowers, there are two groups of children, and there are also two plants, weeds or wheat. Weeds or wheat. And the weeds 
represent the children of the enemy, the wheat represents the children of God, and the implication is we're stuck with each other. The worker said, you want us to rip those bad roots up and get rid of, you know, sometimes you think like, we just need to go into society and clean everything up and make this world a perfect place. And the Bible seems to indicate that's never has happened and it's not going to happen. And we're in a situation where as a minority voice, we have to live among the weeds. And we're planted. We're specifically planted there. But not only does God plant us, the enemy plants his people. And this is, this is wild. This is weird. He can look pretty nice. The weeds can look, you know, it can be pretty, it can be pretty deceiving. Satan can, be, can, can, be, can look pretty sweet, pretty tempting. He can even take the word of God and distort it and misapply it. And, 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 and even somebody who wants to follow Jesus can have the enemy come along and even take God's very word and twist it up and confuse them. I mean, it's... it's it's bad, man, right? That's, that's, that's the reality of the thing. Lots of Bible studies, if you've got, a, if you've got a, like a study Bible and you look down into that section, it's probably going to talk about that the weeds were what they call Darnell wheat. It's wheat, it's, it's seed that when it, was, when it was overseeded, when the good seed was put in the ground and they overseed with the weeds, they say even the Romans had a, had a punishment listed for people who overseeded their neighbor's uh, field with bad seed. There was punishment for it. It was like sabotaging. And this Darnell wheat, when, when the seed would germinate and, and pop up, you couldn't tell it from the real thing. It was only at the time of harvest that it would become obvious which was bad and which was, which was good. It was worthless. And it, the crazy thing is sometimes it feels like, man... I'm living in this environment. You know, I'm the minority voice. I, I got to try to live out my Christian faith and like I, I'm just surrounded by all this stuff. And, and you get the feeling sometimes like, man, I'd like to, I got to do something different. What is there about us? It's always like the grass is greener on the other side of the hill, you know, like. And I think part of what this parable is about is, is embracing the belief that God does plant us. He puts us. That, that there's, there's good reason to believe that because you are who you are and what you are and where you are, that as a follower of Jesus, he's got something for you to do there. I wish you would make it clear. I think there's people that live their entire life and never know what it was all about, but God's at work in that situation. You know, He's planted you there. Pastor Pete Stubbs spoke here at King's Classic a couple months ago and he talked about the very first convert at Saint St King St. Stephen was a man who had been in the automobile industry all his life in St. Stephen. And he was the first. In fact, he tried to hire Pete to work for him. And Pete said, no, I can't. I'm, I'm becoming a pastor. And Pete was leaving the RCMP. And this guy ended up in receiving an invitation to come to church. And he became the first King's St. Stephen convert. And when he was telling that story... An, an older lady who was sitting in King's Classic and had been married to a man by the name of Stan Constantine and they lived as a young couple in St. Stephen and worked in the car business and their boss was this character who they prayed for and prayed for and prayed for years. And until she sat there and heard Pastor Pete say it, she never even knew that their prayers for that guy for years had been answered until Pete said he was the first convert at St. Stephen. What I'm trying to say is, God's got you somewhere for a reason. You're, you're put, he plants you, he puts you in that situation. And then, secondly, there's this framework for spiritual reality. A framework for spiritual reality. Just understanding that I'm in this situation with, with God and my relationship with him and the people who are in my life and the work of the enemy and the work of God and and that's the, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the hand that I've been dealt. And there is a God and there is an enemy and they're at work and they have two different agendas and I'm navigating this world in that spiritual reality and it's very, very important that I have on the full armor of God and I'm listening to the Lord and I'm tuning into what he says and I'm, 
I'm as determined to make heaven my home as God is determined for heaven to be my home because it's a dangerous road and the enemy is at work and he's got his, he's got his, his plans for me and they're not plans for good. And there's this kind of, there's this kind of uh, framework to understand how we fit into the world in this parable. And then lastly, and I, I didn't know what to put for this last point and all I came up with was a freaky and frightening implication. There's a freaky and frightening implication because verse 40 says that as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels, get this, look at this, the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Whew, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. He not only speaks plainly about the devil, the personality, the devil, and his work in the world, but he also likens the gathering of the weeds to be burned and the wheat put in the barn. He likens that to the harvest at the end of the world where the, where the righteous will shine like the sun and the unrighteous will be gathered up for destruction. And he uses some very freaky and frightening imagery. Luke, 20, Luke 13 has Jesus saying the same thing in a little different way. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said, Make every effort to enter through the narrow gate because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, please open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you came from. Then you will say, But we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you came from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping. There it is again. There'll be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves will be thrown out. So just as we finish, I got to tell you that as it goes to styles of communication, most preachers or speakers, they have different way they prepare a message. And like for this message, I drove around for a couple weeks and listened to some other people preach about this when I was commuting and driving and uh, read, prayed in the scripture, just kind of just kind of soaking on it. Then I get to the point where I dig out a legal pad and I you know I make some little notes here and there and scratch some things down and I've gathered some scripture passages and I begin assembling it kind of begin weeding it down to you start and then in the midst of that you're trying to think how can I how can I organize this in a way that people can grab it and remember it and you, you think about an outline and you think about a few things and starts going together and then you get that outline and you start you know you start manuscripting it scripting it and you kind of thinking of what am I going to say about this and how much time am I going to spend on this and you kind of going through that and when I, I, I did that and I got to this last point a freaky and frightening implication and I put the scripture in there and then I thought, man, I got to say something about this. But I got nothing. <laughs> like I said, Lord, I got to have, I need a closing illustration. I got to kind of tell, I got to kind of do something with this. I got to apply this at the end. It's like, that's it. That's it. That's what the parable is about. That if you're in the family of God, there's going to come a time at the end of time or when you, when you pass from this life when you're going to be very, very, very glad that you were in that family. And if you're not in the family of God, you've never been born into his family and become a Christian, you've never felt remorse for your sin and you've never felt a hunger for God and called out to him and say, Lord, I need you, I want you. I, I, I need you to forgive me, I, I need you. If you've never kind of gone through that process and that's why baptism is so beautiful it's like I don't care who knows I'm in this thing right if that process however it's not the same for everybody but it's a lot the same if that's never happened to you and you've never been born into the family of God and you die 
or you're alive at the end of time when the wheat and the weeds are like it's not a pretty picture. That's what the parable says. But I did come up with one more thing. And I, I heard two or three different people preaching this that included this. And I thought, man, this works. And that's this. Weeds can become wheat. Pretty cool. It's not, not specifically there in that passage, in that parable, but it's all over the New Testament. It's what we were celebrating last week. You are, you are a weed. If you've never become wheat, you are a weed. But you don't have to stay a weed. That, that, that you can step through a, a, a growing relationship with the Lord through the Holy Spirit where you come to an understanding of your need of Him and you lay your life down before Him and say, Lord, I'm yours and you are mine. And mysteriously, beautifully, supernaturally, you change from being a weed to a wheat. You go from being a child of the enemy, a child of the devil, born in sin, conceived in iniquity, as the Bible says. You, you change from that spiritually. You change and you are adopted into the family of God and you become his child. And, you know, there's probably num numerous people within the sound of my voice that, that need that to happen in your life. There's a bunch of great things from this passage that speak to us, but boy, that's, that's the big one. That's the huge one. That's probably, I mean, that's, that's what. So I want to pray for you. That, uh, that if you're at that place and that point and all these things have been working together and this message becomes just maybe a part in that process, that you will, uh, you will bow the knee and uh, make your peace with God. Father, I thank you for every person within the sound of my voice. Thank you for uh, thank you that we can be in your presence. When we're in your word, we're certainly in your presence. And we have felt your presence here today as we have worshiped and prayed. And uh, Lord, I pray for the person in this place today uh, who, who knows deep in their heart and in their spirit that they are not a child of the king. They've never been born again. They've never... They've never humbly repented of their sin and called upon you for forgiveness and mercy. They've never invited you into their life, Lord, to take charge of their life. And I pray, Lord, that if this is that opportune time for them, that today, that today, Lord, or in the, in the, in the few hours ahead of us, Lord, that they would do the most important, make the most important decision that they ever will be called upon to make, and that's to choose you and to turn their back upon the enemy and renounce their sin and claim the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God over their life. Would you do that for some person today? I think about the time in my life when you did that for me. I think, Lord, about what was going on in my heart when you made me so aware that I wanted to spend eternity with you and I did not want to live foolishly and risk Eternity, an eternity of separation from you. And I felt you speaking to me and leading me and calling me. And I felt such guilt and such remorse for my sin. And I thank you, Lord, for the day when I came to that point of bowing before you and calling upon the name of the Lord. I thank you for the promise, Lord, that says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I thank you for that in my life. And I pray for that in the life of someone listening today who knows that they need that more than anything else. Would you stir them and draw them and defeat the voice of the enemy in their life and put them, Lord, maybe they come and pray with one of these counselors. May they get on their knees. May they this very moment reach up by faith and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we will give you the thanks and the praise. And as your word says, even the angels in heaven rejoice at the prospects of one person coming to know you. And we rejoice in it today, Lord, and give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen.